Hello, everyone. My name is David Grindle. I'm the executive director at USITT, and I'd like to welcome you to our worldwide conversation on the state of theater and getting our industry restarted. I'd like to say thank you to our partners at Wanger and J.R. Clancy for sponsoring and co-hosting this with us today. And I'd like to start with a brief video letting you know if you're not familiar with Wanger and J.R. Clancy a little bit about who they are. Behind the scenes, you understand the nerves, the excitement, the hard work, and practice that comes with preparing for a performance, an event, an audience. We live for this. We design the products that help make performances come together. And we engineer the products that you can trust so that you're confident from the first rehearsal to the final curtain call. We perform. We are Winger. J.R. Clancy. And with that, I'd like to uh, introduce my colleague Toby Smith of Wanger. Good morning, everybody from around the world. My name is Toby Smith with Wanger Corporation, J.R. Clancy, and um, I am a business development manager for the international department at Wenger. So I just want to be able to introduce um, our panelists today. So if we could go around, uh, I guess, our circle and uh, find out, you know, give us a brief interview or overview of, of yourself and uh, where you're from. And Gabi, uh, let's start with you. Oh, you're muted, Gabi. Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for participating. And uh, my name is Gabi Höck. I'm from Germany. I'm co-owner of a company called HOAG. We are designing aluminum constructions for theater and opera houses worldwide. And beside this, I'm the chair of the Technology Commission of Eustart and um, member of some of the um, standardization processes in, uh, the, in uh, Germany and in Europe for the um, event industry. Um, and I was vice president at the German Theater Association for at least nine years. So I'm quite familiar with uh, what's going on in Germany regarding uh, the last few months. Can you give us a bit of an update on how things are going, Gabi? Yeah, I can. Um, well, so in Germany, the lockdown started uh, exactly at the 15th of March. Uh, that was the day when um, every uh, performance place had to lock down. And uh, I think the first shock was because it, ca it, it came all of a sudden. Nobody was prepared because nobody expected to, that uh, really a lockdown is coming in. Uh, I think most of the people had this for the first time, this kind of a situation. So um, the first few weeks, I think, just were um, that uh, society had to overcome this uh, deep sitting shock that was also fueled by the media and the pictures that we uh, uh, saw from Italy, because Italy was the first hotspot of the pandemic uh, in Europe. And it was really frightening uh, seeing these pictures and seeing the northern part of Italy, how, uh, how they had to handle uh, that uh, many infections and so many people that died from the infection because they couldn't, um, couldn't take care of them. Uh, but also at the same time, uh, the cultural industry um, uh, started, to, started to set up working groups and um, get connected via all the networks we have in Germany and also with our neighbors, the German-speaking countries, Austria and Switzerland. Um, we started a network um, sharing our situation and also sharing ideas and visions uh, how we can handle the situation of having this lockdown. 
lockdown because lockdown in a theater and in a performing space means uh, um, you will not have any return of investment you will not receive any money um, you have to stop your productions and all the planning for the next season all of a sudden um, disappears and you have no idea how you want uh, to move forward at the same time luckily I must say here in Germany, our government uh, released a huge package of financial support, not only for a performance industry, but um, also for the performance industry. I think it took them a while to understand and to see the impact, um, um, the economic impact of the event industry within the whole um, economy in Germany. And uh, it uh, took uh, the associations a while to uh, let the government know how important it is to support the theaters and the performance places, congress halls and small centers, uh, because um, on those also the cities are dependent on with all their tourismic um, money they receive. So, um, and uh, by having these working groups, um, uh, we had this network, uh, and also, since Germany is divided into 17 states, each state communicated um, among each other and we, we were allowed to reopen in, in the middle of May. Of course, uh, we had to consider a sanitaire concept. Um, we have a trade association that developed within two months a guideline which was a general guideline for everybody so that you at least could find some uh, general information how you could um, start a sanitary concept for actors, for your staff and for the audience. Uh, Switzerland was very, um, very quick in this um, because they, uh, since it's a small country and they only have like seven big houses, they started a study to reopen their houses with um, more than, I think, 150 up to 200 people um, in their audience because they wanted to find out how the COVID-19 really affects uh, the infection rate when you're coming to a performing space. And everything was prepared for that. The result of this study was that, um, that the theaters were prepared very well, but the society has so much fear up to today to visit um, um, a performance that even though you, you, um, you stay with your sanitary concept, you, um, uh, you only will use every second seat and uh, every second row, uh, people are afraid to come because they still um, are afraid of um, getting the infection. And I think this is right now uh, the biggest um, challenge that we here in Germany have to overcome this um, fear in the society and to, <coughs> to, prom prom to promote that um, visiting um, a performance is really a safe trip in the evening. So this is the situation right now in Germany. Um, what I think also is very nice because um, a lot of exhibitions uh, were cancelled. Uh, the German Theatre Association shifted and postponed its uh, biennially um, uh, exhibition to uh, end of October this year and it will take place. Uh, we, um, we have an agreement with the city where it will take place uh, due to the sanitary concept and on this exhibition for the first time we also invited uh, companies from the medical sector that present uh, new ideas and innovative concepts how to um, how to clean up air and how to clean up um, each part that you may touch like a handle on a door and so on so this is be a quite new thing um, and this will also be supported financially by the government for the theaters at least in the private sector Great. And uh, let's move forward with Juan Pablo Rosso, who's on the phone from Bogota. Okay, well, uh, good morning from Colombia. Uh, afternoon, evening for some of you. And thank you for this invitation. It's nice to share uh, how are we dealing with the emergency in our market around the globe. 
Uh, first, I will introduce myself. I am Juan Pablo Rosso. I'm an architect um, dedicated to the design and renewal of venues and theatrical facilities, uh, well, let's say around Latin America. I run my, my, my own company. It's called Architorium. And well, here we are. Um, about uh, Colombia, well, the mandatory lockdown uh, began on March 25th. Uh, we are currently in, in lockdown and at least until August and shortly beyond, I would say. During this time, all the venues have been closed and for now there is no date in sight for reopening with present audience. It's sad to say, but during the lockdown, many theaters have declared bankruptcy, uh, especially private ones and the situation of the large ones has been or has become more critical. Last week, the Colombian government unveiled protocols for theaters and concert halls to, um, to the return of production of artistic content to be transmitted digitally. Uh, Bogota, the capital city, has not been able to take advantage of this alternative uh, due to measures uh, taken locally uh, to stop the pandemic, but in other cities they, they have. Um, some theaters have gained experience in digital broadcasting, thanks to the fact that they have been transmitting presentations uh, with audience for several years now. And during the time of the quarantine, uh, they have been um, uh, retransmitting uh, this content that they took years before and even taking advantages of alliances with other theaters in Latin America exchanging content. I guess now the target is to continue straightening the digital alternative and continue supporting the artist in order to generate new content. Well, thank you for that, Juan Pablo. Uh, and moving on to Bolani, I'd like for you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and what's, uh, what's the current state of performing arts in your country and in your region. So, hi, um, lovely to have you here. Um, my name is Bolani Austin Peters, and um, I, I run a place called Terra Culture in Lagos, Nigeria. It's an art center and um, we, we do plays, we own a restaurant, we have a gallery. Um, we're really like a heartbeat of a lot of artistic things in Nigeria, in Lagos in particular. Um, I'm a director and a producer, like I said. And um, theater in Nigeria for a long time, in the 80s and 90s, sort of like died out, sort of like fizzled out. And then in the last two decades or so, we started bringing it back slowly um, with the participation of a lot of companies and ours, um, Terra Culture in particular. So um, we just started turning the bend because a lot of people were not in theater anymore in, in Nigeria. Um, so things just began to look good um, in the last five years or so. And um, all of a sudden, COVID struck. And <laughs> we all were, were shell-shocked, we were confused. We didn't know what to do because everyone was um, shut down and um, the lockdown meant really that actors and the entire ecosystem in that space, nothing was going on. And for us in Nigeria in particular, we're most self-funded. My space is a private initiative. So um, we've learned to do things our way by ourselves. So. Uh, we, we, we had to resolve, we had to decide on what we were going to do, either to just um, stay at home and do nothing, or we, we swim. So we opted to, to do things slightly differently. So for a couple of weeks, we did nothing. Then all of a sudden, we, we started grouping and said to ourselves, look, we have to go digital um, and we have to stay relevant because the entertainment space in Lagos is actually thriving. And um, a lot of people are employed, a lot of young people 
are employed in this space. So what we decided to do was to digital. So a lot of our products, um, fortunately for us, we had recorded some of them. They were not the quality that you'd really want to project outside, but we decided that it was better for us to do something than nothing. And it was unbelievable when we started that. Um, we got into partnership with YouTube as well. Um, the response was phenomenal. The first play, we got over 50,000 views in less than 24 hours. And we're like, whoa, clearly there is an interest out there for our content. And so we've dedicated ourselves to pushing our content once every month um, in relation to um, plays on YouTube. Unfortunately, a lot of um, um, theater companies didn't do that. So they don't have that archive that we um, somehow have been able to put together. The other thing that we decided to do, were, uh, we went to the space of um, animation and monologues. Uh, we worked with um, the government in pushing, to get, pushing out awareness content on COVID-19. On COVID so we did a couple of um, um, animation, which we'd never done, but because these are interesting times requiring interesting solutions. We decided to do that. Um, there's a copy that Cody has um, of one of the animations that we did. And they're very Nigeria centric. So it's important that you know, this is about talking about masks and not sharing masks and using your mask essentially. Um, and so that is one of the videos for us that we sent across. We did quite a number of those and they were very well received. People were posting them all over WhatsApp, all over the world, and even sending back to us. And um, we also went into monologues. We started doing a lot of monologues. So we did like a monologue challenge where we asked, um, we just opened it up to the public and asked people to, to um, participate. And we got quite a huge followership. We also um, did like a prize for that. Um, a couple of those monologues I sent to, uh, to Cody as well. Um, so those are some of the initiatives that we started looking at. And, and what we found out was that in the past, your content was relevant within Nigeria. And we've taken our plays to South Africa, to Europe, to Northern Africa. We've been to several cities around the world. What we found was that COVID, in a way, inadvertently invited us with an opportunity to be seen by a lot more people than we would have been able to reach on a normal day because we were not exploring the, the angle of digitalization in the past, not at all. So having a theater, when we normally have our shows in a week, you'll get 10,000 people come in. Now we're having 20, over 20, over 40,000 people in 24 hours. And people are calling from New Zealand and asking, oh, wow, we saw your place. So um, COVID in a way has been a blessing um, in disguise. <laughs> and, um, and, and we've tried to stay relevant, ensuring that our, our job, our foremost priority is to entertain people. And, you know, things were really dire in Nigeria between March and April, you know, people were down, the atmosphere was so negative. And just being able to bring that joy into people's homes, people were excited and texting and asking, what is going to be the next show? What are we going to be seeing? We realized that it's not always about money, it's about the value that you bring to the table. So what we ensured was that we continued the arts, we continued engaging people through the monologues, through the animations, through the YouTube plays. That constant engagement has not died. And I think that's one of the benefits of, um, quote unquote, COVID in this space. Yes, so that's what we've done so far. Wonderful, thank you, Belang. Uh, moving on to uh, Wang Moon. If you could tell us a little bit about yourself and current state. Yeah. Sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's, it's a hello from Taipei, Taiwan. My name is Wan Rongwei. I am the executive director of OISTA. OISTA is an international organization for scenographers, theater architects, and technicians. We, at OISA, we have 30,000 members in 50 countries. You can say that OISA is a network for global theater makers. We come together to share ideas, innovations, and solutions, which is important in a situation like a global pandemic. In terms of the situation in Taiwan, Taiwan is doing quite good in this pandemic because we as a whole society prepared very well 
for this pandemic. I'll give you some example. Like we never went to lockdown. The universities, schools, and restaurants are open. You could say that people in Taiwan, we are living a normal life. So、uh, for now, we only have seven days deaths in terms of COVID nineteen. We have four hundred and fifty one confirmed cases. And then for now, only four COVID nineteen patients are still in hospital. The rest, four hundred and forty, are recovered and discharged from the hospital. So, um, and back to the performing arts, our Ministry of Culture has budgeted forty nine million U.S. dollars to help the artists and companies and theaters in March. In terms of the regulation, because we are doing quite good, so.、Uh, The biggest impact was that back in March, the government introduced a regulation that is for an event that has 500 people outdoor or 100 people indoor are not allowed. That was in March. For theaters, that means a theater can only sell half of the seats because you cannot have more than 100 people indoors, right? So、uh, in April and May, shows are cancelled or postponed. But at the beginning of June, the regulation is removed, so theaters are back in operation now. The result is that we have more performances than before, and tickets are sold out rather quickly, very quickly, I would say. For now, if you ask me, the COVID nineteen impact on theater. Is that we cannot tour to other countries, and we cannot introduce international productions to come to Taiwan. We are an island, so international collaboration is important to us. For now, we have a very good situation in domestic theater productions, but we don't know when and how we can go back to the international collaborations as before. That's a little bit background on Taiwan for you guys. Thank you so much for that. And moving on to Duro,、uh, if you would please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and、uh, a little bit about the current state in your country and your region. Thank you very much, Toby. My name is Duro Oni. I'm a professor at the University of Lagos. I've、uh, worked here for a little over forty years. I've also had some experience. In the university administration, and also working for the federal government at、uh, short periods while on study leave. I think the first thing to say is that when coronavirus first hit the world, there was a lot of fear about its effect on Africa. It was as if、uh, a quarter of the population would be decimated by the coronavirus. But somehow, in Nigeria, we have a population of about 200 million. And we have、uh, a little over thirty thousand cases that have been confirmed, and only seven hundred plus fatalities. I mean, fatality one fatality is bad enough, but、uh, if you compare to what's happening in the United States or what happened in the UK, Italy, France, and all of that, then seven hundred fatalities in a population of two hundred peop- million people has been relatively. Uh, we are not as worst hit, but then the theaters, the cinemas, and the event centers have been shut, and they remain shut. It's only recently, in fact, that some air travel was allowed from Lagos, the commercial capital, to Abuja, the capital of the country. Now, what what we have now is that this.、Uh, Discussion is happening at a time that we just celebrated the 86th birthday of、uh, Wale Shoinka, the playwright and Nobel、uh, the literature winner of 1986. And all the three days of activities, you know, were held online. There were dramas, there were old productions that had been recorded. There were some that were live, and they were coming in from different countries. So. Uh, COVID-19 has opened our eyes to new processes, new products, and new materials. While the theatre, as we know traditionally, is not happening now, 
there is quite a lot of theater that is going on. And recently also, the, my uh, colleague at the University of Ghana, Ekwa Ekuma, we've been liaising to find out what is going on in Ghana so that we are not just talking only about Nigeria. And uh, quite a lot of online dramas are going on. I'll share some of these with you later, you know, in terms of some images that we have from there. Uh, the National Association of Nigerian Theatre Arts Practitioners has also issued some guidelines for when the theatres will reopen. And these also I'm sure that we can talk about later. Uh, but recently, there was an international collaboration via Zoom of uh, a dramatic presentation, Bolua Tife, as the Almighty wishes. And this was a, 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 a production that was written by a Nigerian, a university lecturer in Nigeria, Tosin Tumi. And the cast was rehearsing online. And they had this uh, incredible performance. And this was something that uh, we were all very happy to see. Uh, before COVID, a lot of the theater in Nigeria had moved to some extent to Nollywood, you know, the Nigerian video film industry. But uh, we're also lucky that uh, people like Bola Leo St. Peter's came around some 10 years back or a little more and also started having live performances. At the moment, the university theaters are all shut because there is some uh, strike action by one of the unions on the campus. So the university theaters are shut. But then there are a lot of dramatic skits that are coming out from the universities and also from the cultural centers. These are like purpose hit uh, little skits, some of them for two, three minutes, some of them a little bit longer and uh, some monologues, and they are addressing very, very germane societal issues. And I believe that as we go along, these are, of course, going to expand a little bit more to what may happen. So I must thank uh, Ekwa Ekuma from uh, Ghana for some of the uh, images that she sent to me for presentation at this uh, conversation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So now that we have a, a bit of an understanding of the variety of approaches going on, um, can we talk a bit about what steps you're taking to prepare to do theater, potentially? Uh, or in the cases, one run um, to do theater? What are the some of the ideas? I know, Gabi, you noted that, that the um, the confederation between Germany and Switzerland and Austria has developed um, some understanding. Uh, Vicky Cooksley, uh, who is with Entertainment Technology New Zealand, has posted um, their guidelines um, that include contact tracing. Um, and that's a big issue, especially when we talk about audiences coming and large groups. How are we handling contact tracing um, if we're bringing people together. I know there are some, some interesting solutions. Um, and I'd like to go throw back and start with Professor Oni, um, because I know that, that uh, you have told me about some of the new ways people are doing theater to maintain the social distancing uh, in Nigeria. Well, in doing this, can I quickly share my uh, presentation? Please. Right. Now, let's hope. I know that we did rehearse this yesterday, so let's uh, hope that I can get it <laughs> going. Uh, so, is there anything that you can see as it is now or not yet? No, sir. The screen share is not coming across yet. Yeah. Let's see what we have. Or should I just email it to you? Why don't you email it and we'll have it, uh, we'll um, get it um, pulled up uh, and I'll come back to you with this question. Okay, that would be nice. Just, just go ahead with the others and then I'll, I'll send this to you now. All right, one run. Yes, hi. <laughs> 
Right. Uh, so what's the new normal in theater in Taiwan? Uh, for rehearsals, we need to fill in the form to report your health condition. Do you have a fever? Do you have a coughing, running nose and headache? Every day, you have to do that every day. So that's for rehearsals. And for dance training and classes, we encourage you to wear a mask. For performances, audiences are required to wear a mask. Temperatures will be measured at the door. If your temperature is higher than 38, you are not allowed to enter public space. And of course, we will need to take names knowing who sits in which seat. So for contact tracing, we have several different approaches. The first one is we ask audience to fill a Google form before going to the auditorium. You have to show on your phone that you have filled that form before you can go out, before we let you home. The, the second one is we take a photo of the whole auditorium so we know who sits at which seat. The third one is we ask them to uh, write down the names and contact and cell phone numbers uh, at the tickets. So we know if we get informed that somebody sits on the row five, uh, seat seven B get my infected COVID-19, then we can check uh, everyone who sits around him or her. So that's the new normal in, uh, in Taiwan for now. Okay. Um, Juan Pablo, what are the conversations in Colombia? Well, um, I wouldn't say we have contact tracing in Colombia. Uh, we have testing all around the country, but, but I don't know if really contact tracing. Um, about theater, uh, I will divide this into two different topics. First one is creating new content and the return of live audiences as a second one. About the first one, creating new content. Uh, as I told you, uh, there has been recently unveiled some, let's say some protocols to come back to that uh, stage. Uh, but whether for digital broadcasts or live presentations, some artistic forms with opposed nature to the biosafety protocols, such as choirs or brass and wind uh, groups of an orchestra or opera or some forms of theater and dancing must be, must be rethinked. How to generate new content uh, without putting at risk the artist or the present audience. So there are being, uh, I mean, new languages, uh, new musical pieces, new forms of dance are being, are being uh, uh, generated. Um, group separations, distances, I don't know. The, uh, the artist has to adapt because if there is no artist, there is no presentation. And, and then the venue lo loses the reason of its existence. And the second one, uh, which is the return to live audiences, um, actions as distancing, improvement, uh, improvement in, 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 in cleaning, uh, greater air, air near you all cycles per hour, things like that are being synced but nothing is being done yet. Um, based on the experience uh, seen in other countries, it is believed that the gradual return of distance audiences within the theater will be possible in the medium term with an estimated capacity of up to 25% of the full capacity. But for now, this, this is not being encouraged in support of public policies. Okay. Um, professor, we are ready to uh, support you with uh, video. Uh, so Cody, if you can bring up his presentation. And Professor. Right, thank you very much. So if once I see it on the screen, all right, so the first one there, that's a map of West Africa. I mean, it's quite uh, about 16 countries make up uh, West Africa. And then the next slide 
is uh, Nigeria, which is of course a very large country. It's got uh, 36 states. And then the next uh, slide just has some references of some major works, you know. And then the next slide has uh, the Nigerian National Theater, of course, with the image of uh, Walesho Inka, who just marked the 36th birthday. And that was a lot of activities for over a three-day period, both in terms of seminars, conferences, performances, and the rest of them. Now, the next slide is a picture that does look similar, but actually from two different regions. The one on the left is the National Theater of Nigeria, and the one on the right is the Bulgarian Hall of Sports and Culture in Varna, which was where the design of the National Theater of Nigeria was taken from. So if you took a photograph of the, then you've got the National Theater of Ghana with a very notable name there. FYT Sutherland. And then some of the notes from uh, Dr. Ekuma, you know, of course, that the university system there in Ghana, you know, started teaching, but they had problems when they got into uh, practical classes. And the same uh, problem would occur everywhere. I mean, when you are teaching uh, students acting and all of that, at what point do you now teach them online? I mean, they've got to interact with each other and all of that. And so we've created uh, some face masks that uh, people are beginning to use, you know. Now, some of the images from Ghana also indicate that uh, for auditions, for a production, there are now virtual auditions, you know, the things that we used to do. And then there is some conversation also going on in Ghana in terms of uh, the coronavirus and its effects. And then you, the next image actually has a performance and you can see the telephone as the image there that uh, they're going to have a comedy show and people are going to be required to pay 20 uh, CDs, Ghanaian uh, CDs. And so that's, the, that's like becoming the new norm. But of course, we, are, we cannot stay within this new norm over a period of time. Mm -hmm. The next image is the Muson Center of Nigeria, and that has also been shot through the period of the, the coronavirus. And the next image is a Nollywood, that's the Nigerian video film. And uh, of course, that also has been shut down because of the nature of the contact. I mean, you've got people wanting to make, do makeup for characters and all of that, and they are literally just sitting on their faces. And so that's not something that's going to but recently, the federal government of Nigeria set up two committees, you know, a, one to look at the effects of the COVID-19 and they made uh, his comedian Alibaba, you know, the chairman of that committee. Of course, it's a very large uh, committee. They've got uh, so many, 22 members of them. But also the Lagos state government, we are the headquarters of the cultural area in Nigeria. He is also has set up uh, a committee to look at uh, the issues of the COVID-19 vis-a-vis the situation in Lagos. Now that's an image, the next one is an image of the guidelines by the Nas Nigeria National Association of Nigerian Theatre Arts Practitioners. And that's the image there. And they were brought in the guidelines of how theatre should be open. The next image was a performance that took place in Abuja and it was called the drive-in theater. The drive-in theater that we knew in California was for the cinema, where the screen was very large. But this was now on the stage, but they were able to run the sound through some uh, links, and it went to people while sitting in their car so they could follow the production. And the other last that I put out is the Bulua Tife. That's a performance. And the actors were from South Africa, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, and Lesotho. Now, of course, I mean, this was something that would not have been possible normally that you are going to pull actors from across the world taking part in one production. But these are some of the new opportunities that are opening up given the coronavirus. Now, recently, the cinema owners of Nigeria also said, look, if you are opening up the airport, we have the same protocol. People arrive at the theater, then they are ushered into the hall. You can maintain social distances. 
and they can then you know watch their, their their cinema so we expect that that's something that would also come up for now also with the theater itself so thank you very much for that thank you thank you professor um gabi uh if you could talk a bit about the protocols uh in the german area of europe and also what do you think do you think some of these protocols will become permanent or are they going to be temporary uh for the pandemic well uh, for, i think um i have to say that especially in germany um we we in, the, the government introduced an app a tracing app uh three weeks ago and it was a long discussion among the society uh, because especially the Germans, um, they have a special relationship with data protection. So data protection is a huge uh, topic um, whenever it, it's going to be applied. So, so it was a hard time to, to develop an app that um, whether people feel trust in that not too much personal informations they are given away. Um, we are 80 million people in Germany um, and uh, we have been told that uh, if 15% of the uh, society download the app, it will work properly, properly uh, to, um, to um, define where we have a hotspot of uh, the pandemic. Um, we reached this number somehow. We have like 12 million people using this app right now, but um, it's not discussed among the event industry in the theaters. Um, and I think we have to divide there uh, this, um, this event industry where we have the performance space in the theater and the opera houses, and then where we have the event spaces uh, like outdoor rock and roll and um, concerts. Um, and the exhibitions and uh, also, you know, events in a museum. This is totally different. Um, we are not well prepared, like uh, Wan Yong was telling it in Taiwan with uh, temperature measuring systems in front of the entrance. What we are well prepared for is the normal standard um, sanitary concept, like um, keeping a distance, um, helping people to do so, uh, marking lines on the floor, uh, guidelines in one direction you have to go uh, so that people do not cross uh, directly face to face um, and uh, they, they, uh, they, um, they support with, uh, with um, uh, enough soap and um, uh, other sanitary um, uh, solutions you need. Um, but they, in Germany we are not so prepared using this tracing app, although I believe everybody knows that this is one of the best solutions because uh, the researchers um, um, are showing it in many studies. This is going to be a long-term process and I, uh, right now I don't believe that this will be, uh, be a permanent installation because when the government introduced the app, they told everybody uh, that it it's going to be a temporarily uh, installed application. So um, I don't know, maybe this will change here, um, but I'm not so sure about it. I think the society believes to get along without tracing. And I believe that I have the feeling here in Germany, the society still is not accepting uh, the fact that we have to live with the COVID-19 and we have to live with this new normal life so uh, the new normal life means uh wearing a mask um uh, taking care of each other more than we did before um, um being aware of that uh, somebody is collecting data from us like my temperature um uh, do i'm looking like i'm getting sick or you know uh, tracing me where i'm going to where in which places i meet which people so i think this is something that we have to overcome so um, as we talk about overcoming and, and also adapting, Bola, you have uh, had to pivot to help keep people employed. Um, and so I'd like to show uh, briefly one of the videos you created uh, for the uh, health awareness campaigns in Nigeria. Cody, 
could you uh, run that video? Uh, uh, yeah. ah, my guy, Jimmy, it's mascara. It, uh, no, not that much. Now you try to do. Yes, I was the one of yesterday. I own her. I can't keep her for hours. No shaking. <laughs> <laughs> you really get time for this, your mask on to know. Yes, eh. Ah, who know what make coronavirus catch her? Go get time for mask. Go. But I just said they say, once we wash hands, no we holler again. Don't be there, you endo. You know, no say crow they fly. True, no wish. This one pass wish, oh. As me with you stand so. You see, as I give you gap here. Eh? Eh, now nice. that one, now your winner. Since all this corona something. Uh -huh. uh -huh. So as we did so, me a cover, you say if you cover, if you sneeze, or you cough, or you yawn, or even as with the yarn say, if your speed can't fly, you know quick get out my nose, or my mouth, you know go quick get out, me say, I know for mugo for koro. Mm. So, did you the flies with the talk so, or even as I ask, as I cough, <laughs> uh, shift! Three feet. Uh, uh, come, you get you get another copy or have you borrowed this one when you wear so? My guy, which level now? Buy your own, you know cost. Eh? No share mask, no shake hand. Now the level be that. This public service announcement was brought to you by the Lagos State Ministry of Health. A BAP production. Don't let it spread. Don't let it spread. Bola, that was lovely. We were, um, you know, one of the challenges I think everyone has discovered is that people don't understand how much they need the arts and artists until they're all at home watching television, watching streaming theater, watching consuming art, and then they don't realize that they've even done it. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what you're doing there? Um, so that particular um, video animation is about, is in Pidgin English, so it's not uh, what you probably understand. <laughs> it's about not sharing masks, you know, that everybody needs to have their own. And um, all the protocols of, you know, staying apart and, um, yeah, covering your face and nose and mouth. Um, but what we did was we did a series of those for Lagos State Government and the Ministry of Health, um, addressing all the different aspects of... Um, COVID-19 awareness, you know, so we did those targeting children, we did those targeting parties, we're party loving um, people, we love parties, so <laughs> we did the targeting that. We have all sorts uh, looking at different aspects, um, but what we, we were trying to achieve essentially is to stay in the minds of people that the arts is not going away, we also helped people to heal because it was really difficult times for a lot of people in Nigeria. Um, people were not able to go out. Our government is a lot more tougher in terms of containing the spread as opposed to some countries. And I think they've done a brilliant job in ensuring that the numbers are kept low. Uh, so um, we had to keep people's minds engaged in those three months and it's continuing um, what we've done there. And what we did also was we took um, our plays um, on radio. So uh, a lot of those plays also came out on radio, five-minute plays. Um, everybody has access to radio. Uh, radio is one thing that cuts across every income level. So that was something very powerful as well. So um, those things to keep people motivated and um, also to generate income for those in the industry. Don't forget that at this point in time, the industry, we're not talking about just the actors, we're talking about the entire ecosystem of makeup artists, hairstylists, um, so many people that are affected by this um, lockdown. And we do not really see um, an end in sight immediately in Nigeria because we're not allowed, even up till now, um, to have gatherings more than 20 people. So um, I, I don't see theater happening anytime soon. Um, so these kind of measures of radio plays and um, digitalization of all our content is going to be um, some part of the future. However, I do not think that that will be permanent because social creatures and um, people will still crave the energy, the feel of theater, the feel of um, raw performance. Um, I think these will be things that will exist for a period of time, hopefully when a vaccine is probably got. 
um, things go back to how it used to be with all the health um, um, screening that um, Wan Young has, had mentioned earlier. We're also looking at those putting in place um, the um, temperature checks, the sanitizers, all those um, equipment we really have here in place, and also limiting the numbers of people in the theater at any point in time. But the arts has to continue. So we continue, the bid goes on. And, um, a lot more people are, are getting a little bit more energized that this is not permanent, it is temporary. Um, and then we'll continue to do what we do best, which is just churning out content to keep people alive and to keep people happy. And as Prof um, Drew uh, had mentioned earlier, Drony, um, we, a lot more people having seen that people were not just sitting back and waiting for help. A lot more imagination, a lot more content beginning to come out. Um, I sent um, a, a one minute clip of a monologue, the challenge, and I thought it was absolutely brilliant because it was almost like we were discovering new talent, even in the midst of COVID, giving young people an opportunity to showcase their, their talent. So I don't know if, um, if um, Cody can show that. It's a one minute clip of um, the monologues that we got. The, the quality was absolutely brilliant. So while Cody is, is uh, queuing that up, uh... Bola, the, the comments that are flying in about how much people loved the work of that animation. Um, so we will make sure to share that so that people can see um, different ways people can use the arts. Um, I, I, will, I would like to say, um, just to respond as Cody gets uh, things ready, um, there was a question about Bola uh, beginning a collaboration with USITT. USITT as an association, um, actually came, uh, was able to connect uh, with uh, Bola and Professor Oni through our partnership with the African Theater Association, um, just as uh, we met uh, Wanrun through Oista and Gabi through uh, DTHG uh, and the association in Germany. Um, we, uh, we're always seeking to leverage our partnerships with different associations. And we are certainly thankful uh, to Wanger uh, for bringing Juan Pablo into our orbit as well, because I think um, he's uh, really got some great insight as to the challenges that are equal, uh, equally being faced around the world. Um, Cody, if you're ready, we can run that video and then we'll go to our last uh, question. Let me tell you a very short story, Constable. Hmm? I have a dog. I have a dog. His name is Shadow. So one day I was on the couch. I was having some chocolate and my dog wanted to have some of it. I refused. I remember he started pouting and he wrapped himself around my leg, trying to convince me to give him some, but I still refused. And so when he saw that I wouldn't give him, he just went over to one corner. And I remember he looked so sad. <laughs> now, I wanted to ask, why didn't I just give the dog some chocolate? Well, you see, Constable, chocolate makes dogs very, very sick. So I knew no matter how much he would have wanted me to give him some chocolate, I wouldn't have given him because he would have ended up very, very sick. So you could say that I had my dog's best interest at heart, which is what you should have done then. You told me yourself that that person was not a paramedic, neither is he an essential worker. So in fact, you have no business being on the road. So instead of you to educate him, perhaps he doesn't know why he has to stay at home. You collected 500 naira. God. Is this amount worth his life? Tell me, Constable, how sure are you that that person was not infected? Okay, let's assume he was not infected. What if he goes out there and infects himself somehow, goes back home, infects people, now a bunch of people are infected just because you refuse to do your job? God. How are we supposed to defeat this thing when we are not even on the same page? <sighs> Constable. Let this be the last time I warn you about this. The next time I reprimand you, I'll be taking your badge with you. Do you understand me? I'll get back to work.
Ola, that was incredible. So we had a theme, unity, um, unity in the face of um, COVID-19. So we just threw it out there that people should come up with monologues about unity. And she had this wonderful story about just doing the right thing. That was essentially what she was saying. Well, it, it really came up, you know, how can we defeat this if we're not all on the same page? Um, here in the United States, as many of you may be aware, um, our industry is for the most part shut down. Um, a few theaters have tried to open and then shut back down after an outbreak hits in their cast. Um, we've had some interesting theater, don't get me wrong. Um, we, what has been successful are the few people who are trying things differently. Um, a, a comment from one of our listeners noted that Ontario, Canada is requiring theaters to separate the performers from the audience by means of a plexiglass or other impermeable barrier. Um, Juan Pablo, what do you think about that? Do you think, is anyone else requiring this? And what are the kinds of adaptations we might end up in? Well, uh, does he mean maybe a full screen between I, I, the stage I do believe and the audience? That is what he means, a full stage. Well, uh, it's I, I think that, that's the wall. That's a big challenge because uh, you will you will lose the live uh, sensation of the of the presentation. Uh, you won't have uh, direct sound. You won't have. Uh, I mean, I think it's a it's a pretty interesting idea, but but uh, it it misses the humanity of the of the live presentation. Um, well, we have had here uh, well things like. Uh, that say small uh, divisions between people, between artists, between between groups. I mean, as ideas, because we have not come back to 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 the real life audiences uh, presentations. But but I think we are living a time of of uh, let's say ideas shower, <laughs> and and everything is valid. We have to check on everything and and just work on that. Yeah. Um, you know, there are many different ways that, that we can approach theater. Uh, Professor, you had um, uh, some thoughts on the ways people are approaching outdoor theater. Yes, yes. I think that, you know, with uh, part of the problems with COVID-19 is putting people inside a contained space. A major paradigm of performances within the African continent is what we refer to as outdoor theaters, theater in the round or some arena theater, which really puts people in the open space. And I think that these are uh, areas that we must explore. I mean, not having the closeness to the audience, but at least being able to have performances in an, you know, and there are very many of these theaters, I mean, in the universities in Nigeria, the Amodobelo University, the University of Abuja, the Obafemi Awolowo University, the African Studies at Ileife. And virtually a lot of the cultural centers within Nigeria and the West African sub-region also have these theaters where there is that uh, space. Because when you are in an open space, of course, and you can have the social distancing also, then the idea of having uh, the, you know, those virus things running around in an enclosed theater also become problematic. So I think we should be considering more and more of the open air theater kind of performances while still maintaining the safety of the audience, the safety of the actors and the rest of them. But we really can't stay like this forever. And uh, even when the vaccine is found for COVID-19, when are we going to have another COVID-20 or COVID-21 or COVID-22? And are we going to get back into another problem? Now, this is, let, let me show you this. This is a new trend that's happening in Nigeria now. You know, and everyone has this uh, shield. 
Of course, you must still use the face mask even when you use the shield because it's got a lot of openings, but it also does help to prevent uh, people getting close to your face and all of that. And so I think that the, the traditional open air theaters within the Nigerian and African setup also gives us some opportunities for the opening of the theaters. Thank you. Um, someone did note the plexi screen is a new thing uh, in as of yesterday. It's unclear what they actually mean. And it was certainly not developed in conjunction with the industry. Um, that's a big one that was fairly obvious. Quickly, um, Canada has several, quote, restrictions that are unrealistic, despite theoretically allowing live events in most provinces. Um, I think we're seeing that. Um, what's been interesting to hear from all of you uh, is to see how our industry is coming together to try to create some guidelines. USITT um, is actually bringing all of those guidelines together um, to share with people via our website and several things have been posted here um, that we will share as well. Um, because, uh, you know, people are doing great work, but there's no reason for us all to reinvent something if somebody else has come up with a good solution. Um, we have come to an hour. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to quite all the questions that fed through from our attendees, um, but this has been recorded and will be posted um, along with, we'll work on some links uh, that have been shared. Uh, just a quick pass around for final comments. Uh, Gabi? Up, oh, you're muted, Gabi. I, I thought it's going to be automatically. No, no, I'm fine. Uh, so yeah, thank you for being a part of this uh, in this discussion. Yeah, maybe uh, another another information that uh, we are looking into is um, um, the the di the digitalization uh, in performing art uh, really rents as fast as you never could imagine before. So um, not only that uh, the creative industry has so many ideas um, and the technology is, is, is there and everybody can use it. We, we have these also these drive in uh, movies, they use radio frequencies uh, in the car to, to, to listen to the live performances on stage. We had one month before uh, one, one month before ago, we had, we had a live, the first live performance of the opera uh, in Dusseldorf, where we had uh, an orchestra with 62 musicians outside uh, on stage with an orchestra pit that had a size of almost 50 meter width and four or five meter depth, and the, the actors were on stage uh, with social distances and the. I mean, one of the positive things for the audience was that since traveling was not possible and is not allowed, we had international singers, famous actors on stage, which normally would have been at the Met or so. So, you know, this is also a positive thing for the audience uh, on, on the other side. The people develop, theaters develop table theater, so-called table theater, where people get connected on their TV with uh, the stage uh, in their city to, to watch performances. So I think the, the use of the digital world and the digital media is something that now is on a train that, that will not stop anymore. Juan Pablo? Um, well, um, I think in the future we will, well, we will know a new reality a new normality, let's call it like that. Uh, theater community, and, and I, guess, I guess everybody is optimistic that throughout the next year, maybe somehow the emergency will be overcome and the gradual return of audience will be effective until it reaches 100% again, but maybe with some changes in terms of architecture, in terms of technology, in terms of the type of presentations, but, but I think we will keep being optimistic, keep planning for new ideas and, and keep preparing for, for coming back 
in full. Great. One run? Yes. Uh, speaking from Taiwan's perspective, I would say wearing a mask works. Social distancing works. So uh, everybody is aware of the importance of wearing a mask. That is how we controlled COVID-19. I have read on the news that in some countries, people are protesting, it is my right not to wear a mask. And my uh, response to that is, yes, it's your right, but please use your rights to protect others, to protect people around you. So that's my uh, response to uh, this whole COVID-19 situation. Thank you. Professor, parting words? Thank you very much. I think there is no doubt that the world has been reset and a new world order is beginning to emerge. We must continue to engage. We must continue to engage our art. We must continue to engage the theater and find new methods and new processes for doing what we do. And that's something that I think that we must continue to do and we must use available technology available processes to ensure that the theater does survive and certainly we will survive the COVID-19 or any other future COVIDs that may come up. Thank you. And Bola. Um, yeah, so um, I think that um, digitalizing is critical. We'll need to do that. But that is in addition to the real life performances coming back again. I believe in that strongly and I know it will happen. Um, and in digitalizing our content, we also recognize now that this is the time to also teach young people skills acquisition. So we're also doing digitalizing of um, all our um, skills. So we're teaching, we're starting an academy online, virtual, where students will learn skills such as set design, lighting, hair and makeup, everything done virtually in Nigeria. So that's our next step. So content and skills acquisition digitalization. Thank you. Toby. So in, in closing, um, I would really love to thank USITT for allowing Wenger Corporation, J.R. Clancy, to be able to co-host this webinar with you, David and also to our wonderful panelists that took time out of your day and evening uh, to be able to discuss what's going on globally in your regions. And it truly does mean a lot. Uh, we have quite a few people on this webinar uh, that are taking your words to heart. So this is, this is great information. And uh, we, we are one world and from here, we need to be able to communicate with each other and understand what everybody is doing uh, in our perspective regions to be able to overcome this pandemic. So thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much for allowing Wenger and J.R. Clancy to be a part of this webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our guests. We wish you all health and safety and uh, look forward to a time when we can all gather in person again. On behalf of USITT and Wanger, thank you all. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.